Welcome to my online Bible study. If this is your first time with me, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share with you my knowledge and my understanding of Scripture. If you are a repeat viewer, thanks for returning. What's it going to be like after we die? The Bible doesn't really give us much to go on. Jesus taught us a little bit about what happens after we die, but they were usually in the form of parables, so I'm not sure how much literal meaning that we can put into those parables. But he did teach us enough to understand that there would be a division between those who have true faith and those who don't. Now, this lesson today really isn't about how people are going to be punished in hell or rewarded in heaven. Uh, it's really about the reality of life after death. Just imagine, when we die, we go into an eternal state of existence based upon the faith that we had and the life that we lived in that faith. But there's no do-overs. What we get will be for eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but the idea of eternity is a very sobering thought for me. Will I have any regrets about what I did or didn't do? Could I have been a better Christian? Did I really seek out the truth about God? Or did I settle for what I was told by others because I, I had more important things to do? Or even worse, I just didn't really care about it. This is why truth is so important to me here and now. I want to believe in whatever is true, even if I have to pay a big price for that belief right now, considering that I'll have to live with it for eternity. I don't really want to regret anything forever. I want to be able to tell myself that I did all that I could do. So why is truth so important? If we just try to live life as a Christian, isn't that enough? My question is, how do you know how to be a Christian if you don't know the truth? The truth is fundamental in leading us on our journey of faith. What do we actually have faith in if we don't know the truth? People think that they have faith in Christ, but there are many versions of Christ. Which one is the true version? I really wish that the church would spend more time searching for truth than defending their own version of it. I see a great deal of loyalty to the ideas of pastors from hundreds of years ago, but little in the way of researching the accuracy of those truths. Christianity is not based upon loyalty to men, but loyalty to God through Christ. There are so many who say that they believe only in the Bible, only what's printed in the Bible. But their beliefs don't really support that premise. I feel so fortunate that I'm not part of any denomination, so I don't have to blindly believe something simply to be accepted by them. And because, well, they've always believed it that way anyway. Some feel that if we limit ourselves to Scripture alone, then our faith becomes only a matter of interpretation of what we read, which can be influenced by the version that we use. And I've noticed that biblical editors tend to slant their translations towards their own beliefs, which seems to be pretty normal and, I guess, expected. But this is something that we must always be aware of when we study Scripture. And for that reason, we need to read different versions and perhaps get into the original language if possible. But it's not really that simple. At that level, you get into the meaning of Greek words themselves. And a Greek word can have several meanings. And sometimes the context doesn't really make that decision any easier. And sometimes the meaning of a doctrine can either stand or fall based upon the meaning of just one word. So what do we do? We must begin by asking ourselves, what is the purpose of Scripture? 
Is it for us to use to judge others? Is it for us to prove our faith? Is it for us to use to show how many scriptures we've memorized as a sign of our devotion? Is it for us to throw in the face of others to stop them from sinning? No. It's given to us for us. It's meant for us to learn about our failures of holiness and the holiness of God. It's meant for us to learn about our sinfulness and the righteousness of God. It's meant for us to become humbled at God's word. It's meant for us to become models of God's holiness. And it's meant for us to teach others by means of our example of holiness and devotion. But I really don't see this happening today. I see scriptures used to accuse others while they use it to excuse themselves. The scriptures are used to prop themselves up uh, as some kind of authority over others with their secret meanings of scripture verses that are claimed to be given to them directly by God. They have no humility as they stand before God, but pride, which they disguise as holy confidence. Jesus wasn't speaking to everyone else. He was speaking to us, each of us, as an individual. Each of us stands on a slippery slope that can drag us back down into sin from pride. And that's become evident to me when I look at the position that pastors have placed themselves in as they perform their services. But to minister to someone is to take care of them to attend to the wants and the needs of others. And a shepherd is one who lays down his life for his flock. And the Greek word for pastor is poimen. And the term is found frequently in the New Testament and is only once translated as pastors in Ephesians chapter 4. Every other occurrence of the word is translated as shepherd. So by definition of the biblical word, a pastor is a shepherd. Many call themselves ministers and shepherds, but few actually provide that service to the congregation. Too many are more concerned about fame, salary, retirement programs, or having the biggest church. I've always noticed that more and more so-called Christians today are getting involved in conspiracy theories as well as some other strange ideas. And I wondered why this seems to be happening now all of a sudden. What's behind this? So without coming up with my own conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories, I gave this a lot of thought, and I think that I found a common thread to a cause. I think that people in these theories, they believe in these theories because they hide behind them. They use them to cover up their lack of authentic faith. It makes them feel comfortable having special knowledge that they consider to be from God only meant for a chosen few. But believing in something that's untrue can never be a validation of faith because it's not built upon truth. Conspiracy, conspiracy theories have become a kind of prophecy for many. They think that because they have the secret knowledge that they have the gift of prophecy, which they believe legitimizes their faith. It's probably the same reason that some or many televangelists continue to promote divine healings and other miracles for their viewers. What better way to legitimize your ministry than to make claims that God brings about miracles through their ministry? And uh, that he can show his favor, God can show his favor by making them wealthy, rich. The danger here is that many Christians are now using these same things to measure their own faith. If they witness a miracle to, or get unexpected riches, it must be a sign that they have strong faith, that God approves of them. But the true person of faith does not need a miracle to prove that God exists or that their faith is legitimate. 
This is done through the transformation of their character. The true believer becomes selfless, humble, he becomes modest and gentle, and he becomes loving. He turns the other cheek, and he loves his enemy as well as his neighbor. He doesn't care for fame or wealth, but humbles himself and is content with whatever God provides. On the other hand, those without true faith try to measure their faith by how much fame they have or by the miracles that they experienced and how much wealth that they're able to acquire. It's these things that they believe give evidence of their faith. Instead, it's causing the church to crumble and fail, fail to reach its designed purpose, which is to bring each believer to the perfect faith of Jesus himself. Soren Kierkegaard says that there's a difference between a person who wishes or wants to be a Christian and a person who wills to be a Christian. The person who wishes to be a Christian does so only in a theoretical manner because there is no engagement. There's no activity involved in wishing or in wanting. But willing to be a Christian engages the person in an activity towards the pursuit of that goal of faith. But I'd like to add another step. Had Kierkegaard lived longer, since he died quite young, I think that he would have added this step, the step of letting oneself become a Christian. When we believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within us, and we no longer wish, want, or we need to even will to be a Christian. We simply let it happen by letting or getting out of the way of the Holy Spirit and letting him have his way with us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul teaches us that we should not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed so that we may prove the perfect will of God. This means that conformity is not the manner in which the Christian ought to change himself, but rather to allow God to do the transformation through the Holy Spirit of Christ. And I've come to learn that this applies also to the church. We should not allow ourselves to be conformed by any church, whether it's a denomination or a non-denomination. Sometimes this process of conforming us is obvious, and other times, well, it's more suggestive and subtle. There are times that we have to sign an agreement with our church that we're going to behave in a certain manner and believe certain doctrines of the church. Some of these may be perfectly fine, and others may not. We must be careful if we're going to sign such an agreement and not do it in haste or in a desire simply to be accepted or to belong to a church. And the more subtle kind of conformation is done through our desire to belong to a group so especially so that we can become accepted as a bona fide Christian. When we first convert, we have maybe only a little confidence in our ability to obey God, so we tend to look towards others and sometimes copy or imitate them. Now, there are certain things that we should copy, but there's also a point that this becomes a substitute for transformation. At this point, we become conformed to the habits and the customs of worship of other people, and we don't ask questions out of fear of being singled out as a troublemaker. And this is exactly what happens when you ask questions or challenge these practices. You'll be considered as an instigator or a troublemaker. We must allow God to transform us into individual Christians who are authentic and not copies of someone else. A copy is nothing more than an imitation, and God doesn't want imitations of a Christian. He wants the real thing, the authentic Christian. But you might say, but wait a second, aren't we supposed to become one body in Christ? Well, yes, we are. 
But being one body in Christ is not the same thing as submitting ourselves to the leadership of a church or denomination in order to be part of this body. We become one body in Christ only because our submission is to Christ and to none other. It's more a matter of function as we work in the church to evangelize unbelievers and to administer to the brothers and sisters. But many have lost track of exactly what the purpose of the church is and its final goal. So let me remind everyone what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the real goal. It's not to become famous, wealthy, or even become a mega church. It's to help each of us to grow into a perfect man or a perfect person, even unto the stature of Christ. So the true church helps us to achieve this goal of becoming an authentic Christian and transforming us into the image of Christ, while the false church gets in our way by conforming us to their own image rather than that of Christ. Thank you for joining me today, and I pray that this message was effective and that you learned something from it. Uh, and if you did, I hope that you'll either give me a thumbs up to let me know or even leave me a comment. I really appreciate it, and I, I take those comments very seriously. So thanks again. Look forward to seeing you on the next video. God bless, and bye-bye.